if you're new here tonight uh, and haven't joined us yet this week, we've had a three-part series where we've really been just peeling back the curtain um, and sh sharing some of our biggest baddest mistakes, some of the lessons that we've learned the hard way, bone crunching lessons, and it's been a lot of fun. Like at the end of each night this week, we've uh, done a Q&A session, which has been pretty killer. So hang in there tonight, and we're going to get your questions answered. Fire anything at us. We are here for you, whether you got a deal on your plate, you need some funding advice, whatever it is, we're going to open it up to some awesome Q&A later. And yeah, we're probably going to have a little more Q&A than uh, we've had the other nights as well. I just decided to kind of turn the, the weight of it a little bit. Uh, so before we get started, a couple things. First of all, the slide you see is completely, totally incorrect. Well, uh, I know that this is the same title slide we had last night. Uh, basically, I was super busy today out saw a couple houses and just had a lot pulling on me so I didn't have time to really refine the, the presentation. We do have some slides to guide us through our discussion tonight <clears throat> but I apparently entirely neglected the title slide so just pretend that those words at the top aren't there and we're just gonna we're just gonna make good with that. Uh, also I think uh, it might be interesting just to share we have a, a, a pretty sweet deal right now um, in the wholesaling. Yeah, what you got? Hear a little about it. Um, so in the Memphis area, Memphis is a little bit unique because most areas, uh, your downtown is in the middle of town and then everything grows out from that kind of in a circle, roughly. Uh, so Midtown is like a ring around downtown and then it just kind of goes out from there. For us, we have the river, the Mississippi River on the west side uh, so we can't go that direction. So downtown is as far west as you can go in Memphis. And then midtown is just a little bit further east. So our midtown is kind of eclectic. It's got a lot of older houses. And it's kind of one of those areas where the, the, the hippie and hipster crowd would gravitate towards very granola. There's a lot of gentrification going on in that area. But not like the hippie hipster crowd that has money. It's more like the kind of lesser financially stable hippie hipsters. Uh, but then there's also this like really well-known, like well, uh, well-off well crowd that's moving in. So Midtown's kind of weird. You can have like a million dollar house next to a $3,000 house on the same street and it's normal. But it's a good area and we got a lead on a house in the Cooper Young area of Midtown. It was from our absentee owner it was a mail out to absentee owners who've owned the property for at least 25 years in one of our top zip codes. And uh, this gal is deaf. She, not that that matters, but that's an interesting angle to it, communicating with her has been through writing on pads and text messages more than anything. The property itself it has an ARV of about 170, 175. It's a two bedroom, one bath, but it's in an area where two, two, two bedrooms will sell. It's not, that's not a deal killer for it. it probably needs about $60,000 worth of work and we got it under contract. Initially, we got it under contract for $50,000. We renegotiated and renegotiated and we got it, finally got it, got it down to 42.5. And is that renegotiated after doing further due diligence? Um, yes. Yeah, we just we felt like that we didn't have uh, quite as much spread as we wanted. And remember, guys, we're wholesalers only. That's all we do. So anyway, we got a cash buyer who's interested in the property, somebody we've done business with before, a real solid guy, but he doesn't want – it's kind of a complicated situation. The owner's daughter's boyfriend lives in the house, and she – can't afford to get him out of the property until she gets the money from the sale. So she needs somebody to buy it from her so that she can get the money and get him out and move him out, uh, wow. which is a little complicated. And our buyer's like, I don't want any part of that. So here's how we're going to handle it. Uh, we it took, had to get in my mind palace to figure this out. What we're going to do is instead of paying her 42.5, it'll still be we're still uh, buy the property for 42.5, but she's only going to get forty thousand dollars at closing, and we're going to put 2,500 in escrow nice. to be released once her son is out of the property. 
That's so important. That's a huge tip, and I we learned it the hard way. And like, like if you need to get someone out of a property, don't give them all their money at closing. And yeah. uh, like, like, like we we created some form called Dusty is good with legalese. So back in the day, he like created some specific property move out agreement. And like every day that they were in the property after the day they were supposed to be out, you know, money's coming off of that balance owed to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's a great motivator for sure. I see John Walton asking, did she have any other investors look at the property? It seems like most would try to get other offers with that low of an offer. Um, I don't think she was talking to anybody else. You know, she got our letter. Uh, she could have shopped it around, but she is, we don't know the details, but she like, has to have 25 grand as fast as possible. So for whatever reason, she has some kind of debt pressing on her. So she is very highly motivated by the speed with which we can move. So we don't usually do this, but we're actually going to close on this one. Uh, I'm going to borrow some private money. We're going to close on it and probably just own it for like 30 days. And we might not sell it to the guy who's interested in it because I think once we close on it, we might be able to just do a clean and clear and pop it back on the MLS and make an extra 10K on top of what we were going to make. Nice. Yeah, I mean, you could, since you are going through and closing on the property, you could uh, maybe go ahead and make a little bit more. We, uh, Sharon Mendez said she could have talked to the deaf lady for you. She is a sign language interpreter. So nice. take Sharon with you next time. There you go. Okay, uh, shall we get going? Yeah, let's do it. All right. All righty. Welcome, guys. Officially, first off, as we've said every single night, we are grateful to have you here with us. There's a lot of other things you could be doing right now. Who knows? I don't know your life, but there's lots of things that you could be doing. You're here with us, and we really appreciate that. We value your time. We value our time. You better believe it, but we value yours as well, and we are going to do our best to make it worth your while tonight, hopefully challenge you in some very positive ways. Again, keep your credit card in your wallet because we got nothing for sale tonight except more big ideas. We want to challenge, inspire, sharpen, and shape you, just like the previous two nights. All it costs you is an investment of your time and mind for a little while with us. Previously on Awesome REI, we got real. We have been sharing uh, multiple aspects of our stories, mine and Patrick's. I've been in the game 15 years. Patrick's been in it 13 years, and we both have been through a number of wins and successes and a number of dips and losses as well. And we have been very honest and, and truthful about that. And in fact, we've expressed gratitude for the pain that we've been through as well as the positive because those are the things that make us who we are and it gives us a platform on which we can share with you from those experiences and you don't have to go through the same pains that we went through. You'll have your own learning curve, but you can shave some off based on what you hear from us as we, as we share from a vulnerable place. We also focused, uh, back two nights ago, we focused really hard on a game-changing idea, and that idea is your why. One of the quotes we really locked into is there are two great days in a person's life, the day you're born and the day you discover why. Your why is a clear sense of purpose. It inspires you to do what you do. And it's intrinsically tied to your values and your vision. That's not on the slide, but your values and your vision. We talked about uh, a lot of our synchronous values that Patrick and I share. Uh, we shared them with you uh, in great detail, actually. We answered a whole bunch of questions both nights as well. And we also announced uh, our new uh, home base, basically, for all things that we put out there, including this. Officially, awesomerei.com. Lots of exciting things happening. We showed you our knowledge bombs. We showed you, if you, don't, if you weren't here, you don't, you're like, what the heck are they talking about, a knowledge bomb? If you want to, feel free. You can take a peek at awesomerei.com and just get an idea of what's going on over there. Um, so we're totally pumped about that. It's real estate investing for awesome people. Or awesome. And, uh, so, so this is a transition for us. Like originally, way back when... The Private Money Blueprint Home Study Course was launched and the company was founded. It was, we called the company Private Money Blueprint. That's been the real estate education company um, that has produced other courses like Private Money on Demand and Investor Profits on Demand, uh, more recently 10-Hour Wholesaler and others. 
Um, we have now uh, renamed the company. We are Awesome REI, and we are happy to be sharing this with you. Like JP said, AwesomeREI.com is kind of our new home base, and we've got some goodies. We call them knowledge bombs already over there waiting for you. So after tonight, go check it out. And uh, this has been so much in the, the works and in the making, we just are excited to share it with you. We are. We are. Lots of exciting stuff coming for you guys through the through Awesome REI. Uh, also previously, this was uh, last night, we talked about the real estate investor's essential life cycle. And if you might, you might remember this graphic here on the right, uh, those two guys uh, standing there in the shopping mall looking at the mall map. And uh, we, when we went through the real estate investing life cycle, the whole goal of that was to give you the bird's eye view of the game board so that you can see where you are on it. Because once you see the game board from on high and you see where you are, automatically you have an edge. Just knowing what the, what the milestones are that you need to achieve and, and, and the lay of the land is power. And it, if we had known earlier in our careers what the life cycle looked like, it would have saved us a lot. It would have saved us a lot of time and a lot of, uh, a lot of heartache. Uh, we talked about real estate investing as a business versus a hobby. It's a pretty distinct difference. One's not bad and one's and, and the other good, uh, but you just need to understand the difference between building a business and building a hobby and, uh, and what connotates those two. Uh, we covered the five major milestones. Uh, this is part of the essential life cycle of a real estate investor. And those five milestones, you can see them there. The first was that light bulb moment when you first were like, whoa, real estate investing is the thing that's going to get me where I want to go. We've all been through that first milestone. That's when you realize real estate can be your vehicle to take you from where you're at to where you want to be. Yeah. Next is that first dollar, that first deal. And we talked about how critically important that is because it mm -hmm. automatically cements your belief. Suddenly you have proof of concept. It becomes real, not just to you, but to the naysayers in your world who have been doubting wondering if you're crazy because you got into this real estate investing thing. They just do that on TV, you know? That first dollar is really, really important. Uh, number three, the niche hitch. It's a clever name that means finding and focusing on one niche to start with. And it's the opposite of the tool belt approach that you might hear some people say you should have. The tool belt approach to real estate investing says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn everything I can so that I can pull out the right tool at the right time to do any kind of deal for any, whatever lead comes my way. That's an advanced investor approach. It's not something you should do if you're in your first few years of, as, as an investor because you'll make a lot more money and succeed a lot faster being a specialist. There is a little trial and error in the process of finding that specialty. You don't have to nail it right out of the gate, but really the first couple of years in the business, that's your main goal is just to find your niche. You don't have to get, go gangbusters and become a millionaire right away. Finding that niche that matches your personality, your market, your strengths, that's a profound milestone. It's one that most people aren't even really aware of because they usually just kind of start, you know, wherever it is that, that your light bulb moment occurred, that's usually where people just start. You know, I heard about real estate investing through Rich Dad Poor Dad, if you remember my story, and he started in rentals, so I started in rentals. And it took me that trial and error to figure out I'm not a good landlord and it's not a good fit for my personality. So that's the third milestone. The fourth is REI CEO. We really dug into this one. It's how to run your business like a CEO, not like a self-employed person, not like a solopreneur. Come again, Patrick? Like a boss. Like a boss. That's right. Uh, and then number five, scaling your business. That's really the, the most fun of all when you get to go and uh, into the next level stuff. Okay, hang on just a second here. Okay. Remember, we're too blessed to be stressed. I like that. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Uh, all right. So uh, I want to make sure I mention this again. Last night uh, when we were talking about that fourth milestone, uh, REI CEO, uh, we also covered these three markers that are, exist as a subset of that fourth milestone. The first marker, breaking the solopreneur barrier. 
The second, breaking the self-employed barrier. And the third is you operating at your highest and best use, your highest level of contribution. We talked about what each of those looks like and what's required in order to go from one to the other. And we cover the two leading linchpins of your awesome success or your epic failure. The first... Uh, I thought you were going to let me say epic failure. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, I left you out on this one. <laughs> I will let you explain, though, the two linchpins. What are they? You see them there, but why don't you give a little explanation? Number one, commit to candy. Uh, we uh, actually, JP, uh, slightly modified or found someone else that slightly modified Tony Robbins' Can I, which is constant and never-ending improvement. Now candy is constant and never-ending deliberate improvement. And you've got to commit to candy if you want to truly breakthrough um, and have success in life that you want. Um, and that, that has to do with just soaking up knowledge, you know, no matter what level investor that you are, continuing to improve yourself. And uh, we've mentioned all different kinds of ways that we do so, from reading books and listening to books to going to mastermind meetings and hanging out with other entrepreneurs, sharing ideas. Um, heck, both being a student and a teacher as well, which is one of our synchronous values that we share. Um, the second linchpin is committing to identifying and obliterating obstacles. And JP went through his metaphor of the psychic whack-a-mole, which was pretty awesome. Um, but common obstacles that so many of us at different, you know, at all different times throughout, you have to kind of face a lot of different fears. Um, how and where to get started, bright shiny object syndrome, info overload, uh, how to find a mentor, um, building systems, building your team. Um, and we talked about not only how to identify those, how to obliterate them, and uh, good stuff. It's awesome. Hey, I just realized you're not wearing your glasses tonight. You, you going contacts today? No, I just can't see as well. I <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was like, oh, I need to, like, I'm leaning up a little bit. I left him in the car on accident. Oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, guys, I know we covered uh, we covered that pretty fast, but our goal was, you know, we're not trying to reteach what we've already taught. Uh, we just wanted to kind of um, remind you of some of the terrain that we've already covered. In this episode, we're going to talk about avoiding something we call the tactical trap. And we're going to lay out the three axioms of awesome and make a case for um, maybe a paradigm shift that, that you may or may not be used to. If you've been around us uh, for any amount of time, then you may be somewhat familiar with the three axioms of awesome and, and the paradigm that we're talking about there. But if not, this will be probably new for you. So uh, let's begin with the tactical trap. For all my Star Wars fans, you get the joke on the right. Um, you're not really a Star Wars guy, are you, Patrick? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah, that's pretty cool. Like, growing up, uh, we only had three movies, I think. We had Karate Kid 1, we had one of the Star Wars movies, and what else we have? Maybe Goonies? But um, <laughs> I watched a lot of one of the Star Wars movies. I don't remember which one it was, but... All right, so what is the tactical trap? It, it relates... Um, it connects pretty directly to the candy concept that we were just talking about. By definition, it is the mistake of focusing most of your axe sharpening efforts on tactics and strategies alone. Now tonight, for those of you who are new, I haven't really used the term axe sharpening uh, until right now, so let me explain that. Um, the the um, the linchpin committing to candy, constant and never-ending deliberate improve, improvement. Another way we've been saying that is commit to constantly sharpening the axe. That's a metaphor I use like way too much, uh, but I love the the imagery of it. You know, so um, always sharpening your axe is this idea of kaizen, as the Japanese call it, constant, never-ending, even incremental improvement. So uh, you know. As a real estate investor, you know you want to get better at what you're doing. I mean, everybody who's here, you're here because there's something inside you that says, I need to get better. I'm here, I need to be here, and then I need to be here, and then I need to be here. 
But the mistake that almost every real estate investor makes is the belief that the secret to your success is in learning the right tactics and the right strategies. Because I can tell you, looking back on, and, and I've known, for, you know, we're not, we're, we didn't recap our stories tonight, but just as to remind you guys, I started and ran my local real estate association here in Memphis for six years. I ran this organization and had the opportunity to walk alongside hundreds, literally, of newer investors early in their career and walk alongside a lot of experienced investors. And I can tell you, every single investor who I've ever known who has gone belly up in this business, it has not been because of a lack of knowing the right tactic or the right strategy. It has been because of some kind of inner game self-sabotage. It has been something in here, a limiting belief, a, a, a giving in to some kind of fear, um, just some kind of uh, a mistake due to their thinking, not due to the tactics or strategies that they hadn't yet learned. So it's a tragic truism. The vast majority of those who don't make it in real estate investing it's an inner game failure, not a tactical or strategic one. Well, and, and it was this reminded me a moment ago when you were talking uh, last night. You mentioned a mentor of yours who told you that despite you, like he had been a real estate investor for maybe twenty plus years, whatever it was, and despite his being in real estate far more, he said, you know, you have far more real estate knowledge than I do but I make a lot more money. I make like 10 times as much money. Uh, and that, that to me sounds like it had a lot to do with the, with the trap here. Yeah, it wasn't, it, wasn't that, it wasn't that I didn't have the information or the, or the right amount of information. There's a, a common limiting belief that investors have, that, which is, you know what, I just, I just don't know enough yet, or um, I'm afraid of, of making a huge mistake. I feel like I just need to learn more. Um, I didn't feel like I was wrestling with that, but I was. I also, I shared this last night, I, I, I wrestle with the, uh, the problem of perfectionism. Uh, I used to see perfectionism as a strength. I now know it is, it is a weakness, and it's actually fear in disguise uh, many times. So uh, I won't recover that territory again, but it, you're absolutely hitting the nail right on the head there, Patrick, that... Um, I knew a lot more about real estate investing than my mentor, like from a tactical strategic standpoint. He would come to me and like get ideas from me, but he, he made 10 times the money I did. And when he finally sat down and said it to me like that and said, now let's talk about why, uh, that was a pretty game-changing moment for me. So I would like to submit this, uh, this last bullet point you see here, which, man, the bullet point wasn't the thumbs up. I don't know what happened there. No. Oh. But mindset, I would submit, is even more important than any tactic or strategy that you can learn. Unfortunately, most people, most people aren't against the idea of developing your mindset, but they don't understand its extreme importance. Most, in, most people I know, um, you know, they're like, yeah, man, I like mindset stuff. You know, I, I like, I watch Tony Robbins sometimes. I went to, you know, I, I uh, uh, I like to, you know, I like Jim Rohn quotes. Um, when I'm on Facebook, I see some of the quotes. Man, yeah, you know, but it fits into this kind of feel-goodery, like ancillary category, secondary to real estate tactics and strategies, and it's a huge mistake. So this brings us to that's the tactical trap. Okay, this brings us to what we call the three axioms of awesome. Well, and, well, and can, can I even just mention before you toss out the axioms of awesome here, just um, the tactical trap for me, like, I no, was no, in... No, 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 don't do it yet. That's the next slide. Okay, right on. Cool. <laughs> this is what happens when I'm busy. We don't have time to talk about what we're going to do. So, yes, I want to hear uh, what that looked like for you, but at first I want to kind of give, expand just a little bit more and have them understand what, this, what these axioms of awesome are. Now... Um, in the last couple of years, these ideas have, have Patrick and I have been kicking these these around and continuing to shape them. This is something that we also call um, 
a, the definition of what we call a strategic investor. Okay, so what is a strategic investor? A strategic investor is someone who does not let themselves fall victim to the tactical trap. They understand that in order to develop mastery in the game of real estate investing, they need to cultivate mastery in three key areas. And these three key areas you can see illustrated on your screen here. The first is mindset. It's your inner game. Okay? It's the, the 8 to 12 inches of real estate between your ears depending upon how big your head is. And I've already made the case for why that's so important. And you'll notice all three of these, by the way, are at a, they're, they're level to each other, and that's intentional. We're displaying it that way because, really, we want all of these to be given equal airplay in your head and, and with your time and with your energy. Um, so mindset. The second is real estate tactics and strategies, right? That's the easy one. You know that you need tactics and strategies, and that's what you seem, most people seem to be drawn the most towards. The third is business building. Now, Patrick, why don't you open up a little bit on that and talk about the difference between business building and doing real estate deals? Well, I mean, just, just a couple of things that fall under business building, like building your team. Um, I mean, we talked a lot last night about those different milestones that you pass um, as you're growing as an investor. And um, team building is a huge component of actually taking, like from, from doing a deal in real estate to real estate just being a hobby that you dabble with to actually turning it into a business and crossing that fourth milestone that we mentioned last night, the CEO, the REI CEO, and um, systems with your business, um, and, and so much more than just, of course, your tactics and strategies that so many people just focus on. J J JP, what is what is business building? Uh, what, what are some of the things that you've kind of focused on business building wise with your wholesale operation lately? Well, I was just talking to. Uh, a friend of mine, Christina Ferris, about that an hour ago, actually. Uh, we were talking about, um, well, some of what we were just covered, um, what it looks like to run your business like a CEO. Um, a big part of what that means is you have to get yourself, and we covered some of this last night as well, you have to understand the value and the process of getting yourself um, first out of being the guy that wears all the hats. That's your first step. Then, then after you're not the guy wearing all the hats anymore, maybe you've outsourced and outtasked a little bit to uh, some team members. And that's where team building, as you said, Patrick, comes in to play. You learn how to begin to outsource things and how to begin to hire an assistant and hire uh, maybe a virtual assistant, hire somebody to help you with your books, maybe hire an acquisitions manager to help you uh, as you continue to grow. Um, but then you're at a point where you're still the hub of the wheel. All roads point back to you. You're everyone's problem solver. They all come to you for every little thing, which feels good at first. You're like, yeah, I'm running my business, man. But then as you continue to succeed and get bigger and bigger, you're like, whoa, I got like, this is the hardest job I've ever had. And I always feel like it's like, hey, JP, hey, JP, hey, JP, hey, JP, hey, JP. So then you go, okay, this is not working. What do I do now? Well, that's where you take it to the next level of breaking through, like I said earlier, that self-employed barrier and you learn how to not be in the hub of the wheel. You start teaching your team members how to be autonomous. You start cultivating decision making in them. Um, you know, every step of that also involves uh, systems and improving and refining your systems. So people, processes, systems, and automation, those are really the four biggies under the business building umbrella. And those four things are are they really have nothing at all to do with real estate investing. They will just take a slightly unique shape based on the fact that you have a real estate investing business. Mm -hmm. Does that make oh, yeah. sense? So um, what we are committed to doing is giving all three of these their due. We believe that it's critical if you really are trying to build a business and be a strategic investor, these three axioms of awesome need your attention, your time, and your energy. So well, the other, especially the other two that you've probably been ignoring. Yeah, the right and the left really are the ones that, that don't get any love. 
So, now it's time to talk about P and JP's tactical trap adventures. Well, my, mine were... Uh, Look at the, the title still says Lynchpin 1, Always Sharpen the Axe. <laughs> oh, these slides, guys, I'm sorry. Yeah, JP was pressed for time here for the slideshow tonight, but ignore the title. Just the content go with is in here. The, the content is in here. Um, I was in the tactical trap for a few months whenever I first got started, and um, you know I, I really didn't know any better. You know I, I started reading some real estate books, and my mind was blown. Um, I had that light bulb moment, and. I found my way out, my vehicle, and um, I was tearing through real estate books, you know, reading some books. We went to a one-day seminar, bought a big old boot camp and some courses, and um, I'm just studying all the tactics and strategies and trying to soak it up. And book after book, as I was as I was reading, always started with uh, this thing, goal setting, which I wasn't familiar with. Um, and, and, and some of the mindset, mental uh, part of, of, of the game, and I would just breeze through. I wouldn't do the homework, and uh, after about five books in a row that all started with the same stuff, I said, you know what? Maybe I'm missing something here. You know, there's success leaves. You know, okay, I get it, okay? Put the book down. Wrote down some goals, you know, and and then like started instead of just picking up real estate books, I started buying your Think and Grow Rich and your Brian Tracy's Maximum Achievement. This book called Unstoppable Confidence that was phenomenal, um, and so my real estate studies led into personal development and personal growth, and it was a game changer, total total game changer. But for a while there. I was just in the tactical trap thinking that, you know, what I need next is more tactic strategies and real estate knowledge. But, you know, what what actually allows you to break through a fear? You know, it's not typically a real estate tactic at all. It has nothing to do with that. It's all the mental game and it's the it's it's, it's confidence and it's like having an accountability system and much more. Um so once I discovered personal development, you know, my, my, my focus just changed, and uh, I didn't really discover the business building side of things until probably a couple years into the, into the actual business when I realized that we were wearing all the hats, we desperately needed some help, and I started uh, doing some team building first. Um, yeah, so that, well, and, and uh, shortly thereafter, I read the book, The E-Myth, uh, The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. That forever changed the way that I uh, thought about what we were doing as not just, um, you know, me being a real estate investor, but owning a real estate investing business and what that really means. By the way, um, before we get off here tonight, we're going to, uh, both of us are going to give you a series of books that have been very shaping for us, uh, some that are business building and some that are personal development. We're not going to mention a single real estate investing book because uh, those that's not where you typically miss it. <laughs> so um, just maybe grab a pen and paper uh, for later. Well, Patrick will share a handful of them. I'll share a handful of them. A couple of them we've already shared in previous sessions, but um, we're both firm believers in uh, pouring into yourself. You know, the um, I think it's Jim Rohn that said, formal education will get, will, what does he say? Let me think. Uh, formal education will get you a job. Self-education will get you a fortune. Something like that. Something like that, yeah. I so, love, uh, yeah, I love, I love, I don't even know if this is, I think this may be relevant. Uh, I love the Jim Rohn quote where he's like, don't become a millionaire for the million bucks. Become a millionaire for the person you have to become to make the million bucks. Oh, yeah, I like that. Then after you become that person, the money doesn't matter. You can lose it, make it, lose it, make it. doesn't matter. It's about the person you become. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. So um, I've already shared a good bit about um, 
my story in terms of the, the tactical trap, but I'll tell you, the perfectionism for me, um, I know that probably hits a number of you square between the eyes and you think, you know, I, I, I do everything better than most people and yeah, it takes me longer, but I do it better and that's just, you know, that's my brand, that's my jam, that's who I am. And I'm going to tell you, that will slow down your progress. Uh, done is better than per for perfect. That is not something I'm hardwired to believe, but it has been proven to me over and over and over and over again by watching people who have started much later in the game than I did and blew past me in no time flat. And I was left going, those guys are like, that guy's dumb compared to me. I know so much more, and the, what I do is so much better, and yet, you know, like, well, I've been robbed here. What's going on? And it's, it's, the, it's the fact that uh, because I was unwilling to go in fast motion and throw in my, as much spaghetti against the wall as I could because that wasn't perfect, um, I, I was um, like walking in mud. So um, perfectionism and velocity are not friends, and that was a huge, a huge one for me to discover. Um, another thing, too, is... Um, I'm a I'm a man of faith. Uh, I'm a I'm a Christian, and I'm not trying to get all churchy. Um, but when you get into the world of personal development, sometimes it can be challenging to try and explore that world. If if there's anyone out there who can relate to to being a Christian, and and then like how is that congruent with like self development? And you have a you have a belief that you can't really do anything uh, of worth outside of God, and yet uh, you know Tony Robbins says there's nothing I can't do. Um, and there, and, and but what I did instead of letting that keep me away from exploring those ideas, I pressed into those things, and what I uncovered in that journey really freed me up. Uh, a realization of um, how congruent it is, and how how much, uh, frankly, how much how much God wants me to believe in who He made me to be, and how uh, there, one of the biggest. Um, mantras of this stage of my life is stewardship. I believe that I have been given stewardship over, you know, most people apply that financially. I believe I've been given stewardship over the time that I have in any given day, every minute, every hour. I have been given as a gift. I don't own that, but I've been asked to do something of value with it. And for me to not do so is poor stewardship. My family, I I have been given stewardship over the relationships in my family and my wife and my two daughters and I have a, a, a an honorable responsibility to to be a good steward of those relationships and with you guys um, we've talked a lot about our values here and uh, over all three of these nights and uh, I feel like one of my uh, my, my chief elements of my vision is making a difference in other people's lives and that's because I've been given stewardship over the fact that I even that you guys are even here listening the fact that that you'll even give me a little bit of time to have some kind of influence in your life that is not an opportunity that I want to at the end of my life feel like I have squandered so a lot of these types of beliefs that I've developed over the years have have really fueled my and cemented my belief that um, <laughs> that tactics and strategies are not the secret to success. <laughs> to put it simply. Oh yeah. So there you go. I got a little bit uh, got a little bit preachy there. Hope you guys don't mind. Keeping it real. Keeping it real. Good stuff, okay. man. All Good. right. So uh, let's take it back into the real estate world now. Okay. Uh, let's talk about. The Morningdale deal, and what I want to do is, I want to. Uh, this is uh, this is one of your deals, Patrick. Uh, not that I'm telling you something you don't know, but I, I'd like you to take us into the Morningdale deal. Just tell us the story. But I want to challenge all of us who are listening to keep those three axioms of awesome in mind. Right? You've got tactics and strategies, business building and mindset. And as the story unfolds, I want you to notice the components of the story that fit as a subset under any of those three axioms. Okay, some of what you're going to hear Patrick talk about uh, has to do with set 
issues he had to contend with and overcome. Some of it had to do with more business building and some of it was very tactical. So that's the challenge I'm putting in front of you guys. Patrick, take it away, buddy. And actually, as you start, I'm going to step away just for one second. I'll be right back. Go ahead. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. The Morningdale deal uh, was a deal that I did my first year investing. And um, that first year, um, my marketing plan that kicked off shortly after reading a few books and going to a one-day free seminar and um, – we uh, kicked off our marketing plan, and my mentor said you should always have at least three strategies that are bringing leads in um, that you're implementing consistently. And uh, we had a few different things that we were doing. We had a We Buy Houses newspaper ad that we would put in the Post and Courier here in Charleston on the weekends. Um, we were knocking on pre-foreclosure properties. Fun, fun, fun. Uh, we would do research down at the courthouse and pull all of the most recent foreclosures and then just go knocking on their door and see if we could help them. Not fun, but it works. It works. Uh, another one of our strategies was uh, bandit signs. Um, ordered a heaping pile of bandit signs in the shape of a house, uh, yellow and black, we buy houses, phone number, and um, we, had, we had it set where we would put out a certain amount. Like at times, we were putting out 75 bandit signs a week around Charleston. Um, I'd take 25, and my two other friends that I started out working with would take 25, and we'd go hit our areas. And so um, once we were doing some things to consistently bring in some lead and potential deals, um, the Morningdale deal surfaced. He called off of a bandit sign. Um, this is a house. Uh, it's in a neighborhood called Ivy Hall in Mount Pleasant. And the seller called off of a bandit sign. And she, uh, she lived alone. I mean, it was just her. She had some sick family in Virginia. And so she wanted to sell and get out fast. Um, she didn't want her neighbors to know that the property that she, that she was selling. Um, she didn't want realtors walking in and out of her house. And um, she wanted just a quick cash solution. I mean, sometimes, I mean, sellers, people don't want their neighbors meddling in their business. And so, you know, this is a perfect scenario where, you know, Going through a realtor or a traditional transaction or trying to find a traditional buyer is, is not, not best for this woman here. And so, um, so we met with the seller, found out some details, and um, I mean, we were pretty green at the time. You know, didn't really know what we were doing. We were just doing stuff, you know, just taking action. Right. And uh, so, I mean, we found out that this property was free and clear. Yes. Uh, which means that she did not owe anything on it. So she owes it free and clear. She's motivated. She wanted a quick offer. She, she hoped that she could move with e within even a couple weeks. And uh, we made her an offer. And the way we calculated it, we just kind of guessed that you know, the house didn't need that much in repairs, maybe 10000 or so. We, we uh, looked up some comparable sales and thought maybe it's worth one seventy. We minus 10,000 in repairs, that takes us to 160, and we pulled out a fancy calculator, and we said 160 times 0. 0.7, and bam, 112,000. That was our offer. Um, probably a similar formula that you've heard before, and uh, we made the offer 112,000 cash, close in two weeks, and he did not accept it. Um, she said, uh -huh. let me think. He said, let me think about it. And uh, we, our mentor had told us, uh, one of the first little seminars I went to, I mean, this is, I mean, out of the fire hose of information that was coming at me, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I learned and, and soaked up was he said, the fortune is in the follow-up. And he said, most 
the majority of his deals actually don't come from the first time meeting with a seller. It comes from following up with them. So we added the seller to the follow-up blog, and uh, we asked her. You know, she said, "Yeah, please, please contact us back." A couple weeks later, you know, we went ahead and called back because she just wanted a little bit of time to think about it. And that day, you know, we call. She says, "I'm ready," and we like freak out in the background. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, get over there now. Um, my my we partner. Got a deal, we got a deal. It's like a little, like like a what, what's the oh. Benny Hill? And it's like, do, 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 everybody's falling over each other. So we yeah you know, sprint over there, get the contract signed, and then that means that we have two weeks to close. Now at the time, I mean Mount Pleasant was hot. It was smoking. I mean houses were selling fast. If she would have stuck her sign in her front yard, it probably would have sold. Um, but there's all, always people who don't want to go the traditional route, which is awesome. Um, and so we've got the property under contract. We we knew that at 112, I mean, it's just a smoking deal, lights out, just home run. Um, and we figured if we were to get it accepted, we could get it financed. We knew it was a good deal, and we knew okay, whatever we got to do, we're going to do to to get it funded. And so we make a big long list of all the people that we networked with because we've been going to RIA and you know other real estate investors and you know starting to network to to build our team, um, you know some realtors, some mortgage brokers, I mean, even family friends and whoever. We run through the list, and uh, one of my friends at the time that was our finance guy, um, he was you know jumping on the horn. We were trying to get it funded and. Just nothing. Just struck out, and our list it was was we were out. We were we were done with the list, and we did not have the deal funded. And um, we just uh, then made a decision that it was time to strike out on foot. You know, to just go cold door knocking, door to door, basically yeah. to the businesses where we thought that people that knew a good. We were looking for somebody who knew a good deal when they saw one. Somebody in a real estate field that could see the contract and be like, oh, my God, that's incredible. And so we're going around to some mortgage broker offices, some realties, and uh, walk into a place off Coleman Boulevard in Mount Pleasant, and we meet Barry. And Barry sees the contract and freaks out <laughs> and says, you know, after going back and forth, we uh, struck a deal with him, and he said he was in. Um, and literally, this was cold off the street. Now, Barry had a history in real estate. He's a he's an agent. He's a mortgage broker, and he'd been flipping real estate. You know, buying and fixing and flipping deals for a while. He knew the neighborhood. He knew what he saw was an unbelievable deal, and he said, "Yes, I will fund it." Um, so, not a cent out of our pocket. Not not a penny out of our pocket. He puts up all the money. He had a great relationship with his bank um, off of just an appraisal, got us all the funding for the purchase and the rehab, which, is, which isn't typical. But um, you know, we found someone to put up that funding that had it. And uh, we actually, from the day we closed, I mean, Barry had uh, renovation experience too, which we were very green and didn't have much. Um, so he kind of brought that value to the table. And uh, 59 days after we bought it, we sold it, and we cleared over 21,000 in profit. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> um, and, and you know, whether it's your first dollar or your first big deal where you really put some money in your pocket, I mean, talk about paradigm shift, mind blown, limiting belief shattered and new world of opportunity open. That's what happens. And with the Morningdale deal, you know, sky was the limit after uh, after we closed that bad boy. Love it. So the question is, what did you guys pick up on? Did you notice elements of the three axioms of awesome? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, let me re-shrink. I had made you uh, bigger, your face bigger while you were talking, so you wouldn't be so tiny. 
Okay, so the three axioms of awesome at play in the Morningdale deal. Uh, actually, I see we got some people playing along at home. All right, David says mindset, follow up, and do whatever it takes. Before I go into these, let me see. What, what, what do you guys think? Can you think in the story, think about mindset, think about business building, and think about tactics? What do you see? And, and maybe you connect the dots as to which axiom whatever you're going to put in there relates to. I see uh, follow-up is listed. Okay. Rex yeah, says bandit signs. Go ahead. This is that interactive part where, uh, where you type something into the question panel. Yeah, so for example, David did what I'm asking, and just to make it clear, he says mindset, follow-up, and do whatever it takes. So he said here's the axiom, and then here's, here's what Patrick had in his story. Uh, that relates to that axiom. Okay, so can you do that. Let me just give give get, give you guys a second. Um, didn't give up. He had all three tactics: due diligence, rehab, maximum cash offer. Yes, good, David. Mindset: never giving up. Yes, good. Mindset, follow up, follow up, follow up, real estate tactics, bandit signs, business building, team player, on board. Yeah. Set your goal, mindset to get her done. Finding Barry is under business building, even after the list was done. Love it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. All right, so let's, uh, great job, awesome. Thank you guys for, uh, for playing along here with us at home. So let me just um, lay some of them out for you. And this is by no means, I would say, comprehensive, but this is what jumped out to me as uh, I've heard Patrick tell this story before. Uh, so mindset, thinking outside the banks, right? I don't know if you actually said those words when you told the story this time, Patrick, but um, he did not automatically think, I've got to go to the bank to get financing. Uh, and he also didn't just go, well, I don't have the funding, so, you know, I can't, I guess I just can't make a make an offer. Um, in fact, recently I was with Patrick in Charleston, and we randomly ran across somebody in a, in a, huh? This was random. And it was what? at, it was at a, a local watering hole called Crafty Draft. Yeah, and, the, and they were like, uh, what are you guys doing? Where, you know, they were asking what we were, what we're involved in. And we were like, yeah, we're, we're real estate investors. And this guy was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm in real estate too. And, um, you know, but I just can't really make any offers yet because I don't have the funding lined up. And, and Patrick didn't have that belief, or he maybe pushed through that belief in this situation uh, because he didn't have the funding lined up either, but he still went out there and shook the tree. Like, like, like. Like months before this deal, I remember early on as a real estate investor thinking, "How the heck am I going to get funding? Who is going to who's going to give me funding?" Like it seemed Im almost impossible. It really did. I, I remember thinking that, feel having that feeling inside, and just believing all the courses and stuff that I was reading, and mentors and people that I was meeting. Just I just believed that it could happen. And I wish I could tell you guys how many times we hear from people, I just need the money. I, I, I can't do anything because I just have to have funding. I just have to have the funding. And that exact same fear paradigm, it comes up over and over and over again. It's paralyzing, but it is a limiting belief. Patrick did not let that limiting belief keep him from making offers. He made offers. Now, you'll hear people say, if the deal's good enough, the funding will be there. Well, so that was kind of the mantra you went into this with, right, Patrick? Was that you said I don't really get that, but I'll I'll believe it. I'll buy it. I'll just move forward anyway. And then the deal happened, and then you did kind of the best practices of what you're supposed to do to get the funding to show up, and and it didn't show up. <laughs> I got nothing. So then what did you do? Struck out on foot, man. I was scared, dude. You hit the pavement. I did Most not want to do that. that. I was willing to do that. You literally walked into strangers. <laughs> and ask them for money, and that's what worked. That's huge. Yeah, it's. It, it, I mean, it's it's crazy. If you if if you if you get that butterfly feeling inside where your stomach's kind of turning, you know, that's probably a, a sign that you're about to learn something, and you're doing the right thing, and you're heading towards your goals. So Ralph says, Ralph says, ball to the wall. 
Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, you overcame fear of making an embarrassingly low offer. Uh, that offer you made, it was embarrassing, wasn't it? Well, I mean, I didn't say that specifically, but, I mean, making an offer for $112,000 for that house at that time in, you know, Mount Pleasant, whew, I mean, I was, yeah, I, there was definitely the thought of, oh, my God, she's just going to hate us. Um, but one of the biggest lessons is don't think for other people, period. Absolutely. You know, make, Make your offer based on your numbers, based on what you think makes sense for your business model and whatever you're doing, and that's what's important. One of my early mentors in real estate who's still a, a really close friend of mine and still active here locally, he's an older guy though, um, he said to me over and over again, if your offer is not embarrassing, it ain't, he says, if it ain't embarrassing, it ain't low enough. That's what he says. <laughs> That's, that's literally, he, if he's not embarrassed to make his offer, then he goes lower until he starts to feel embarrassed. And, and there's something to be said for that. It really is. You also found the courage, like we've already said, to make that offer even though you didn't have any funding in place. Now, on the tactical side, some of this is pretty obvious. This is what we're you know, usually used to zeroing in on. Uh, you used a time-tested, proven lead generation formula, the Mayo formula, right? ARB times, did you do less repairs times 70 or times 70 minus, less repairs? Yeah, yeah, like after repaired value minus repairs times 0.7 was. Okay. Um, so you use that. Um, you. Uh, times the lead generation. Oh, Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead of myself. The formula is what we just talked about. You also used proven lead generation, which in this case was uh, bandit signs, right? A lot of people don't like bandit signs anymore because they're like, that's so 1990s, you know? Um, but <laughs> it never goes out of style and it never stops working. You also uh, followed up. The fortunes in the follow-up is what you said. And uh, that's huge. That is a, a, a something that a lot of investors really follow up, uh, fail to follow up. I can tell you I've had a number of deals from people that came back around to me because I followed up and they wouldn't have come back to me if I hadn't put them in a tickler file and gone back to them at what seemed like an appropriate time. And in the business building arena, you were tenacious in finding and negotiating deal funding. We've covered that already, but um, that's a pretty key business building strategy. Mm -hmm. So. We're about to turn into some Q&A here, folks, but I want to give you some takeaways before we do, all right? Uh, first of all, don't fall into the tactical trap. Don't do it, okay? Now you know what it is. You know it exists. Get out of the tactical trap. If you're, current, if you're in the trap, get out. You know, now you know better, and it's time to start focusing on some other things that are actually going to allow you to make the breakthroughs to use the tactics and profit from them. Um, also, we've got a couple of recommend, reading recommendations here. Uh, I put these on here. Uh, they're your reading recommendations specifically, Patrick. I recommend them too, but I've only read one of the two of them. Um, why don't you talk about these two, and then if you want to go ahead, we promised, I promised people that we're going to make uh, book recommendations on the mindset and business building side of things. So if you want to start with these two and then anything else you want to add to that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll add mine on top of yours. Cool. I, I just ran it or went over to one of my bookshelves because I thought I, maximum achievement would be sitting there. Maybe it's on the other one. Um, oh, yeah. But um, Brian Tracy's Maximum Achievement, that's one of my favorite books. It, I literally felt like I was on fire whenever I finished reading. I felt like I could do anything. And um, man, man, oh man, I, I went through that book. I've, I've read it several times. I highly recommend it. It's probably one of my all-time top ten for sure, for sure. Um, Unstoppable Confidence. Like when I read that book, I didn't feel at the time that I had, like that I really lacked confidence. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that I'm the most extroverted person in the world. Um, but that book helped me make some breakthroughs specifically as a real estate investor. I mean, I read it during that first year, and it helped me do things that I was scared to do, from calling sellers and visiting properties and making offers. And 
negotiating short sales and et cetera. Um, unstoppable confidence was an awesome one. Let's see. Um, I already mentioned E Myth as far as business building. Um, what is some uh, another great book? Um, anything by Jim Rohn, but his book called The Five Major Pieces of the Life Puzzle. It's an easy, quick read, but so many just of the sentences in there, it's like every sentence is a seminar. Like I've had to just put the book down and just been like, whoa. You know, I had to soak up what I was what I was uh, learning there. But um, Jim Rohn's awesome stuff. Tony Power, Tony Power, Tony Robbins, Unlimited Power. Um, that was one of the big shaping books for me early on. More recent stuff. Um, read The One Thing by Gary Keller. Awesome, awesome book. It's going to help you focus in your business so that you're spending the time on the right things, the things that are going to make a difference. Bam! There it is. Nice. The One Thing. I, was, I, was, I already had that on my stack. I mean, I would say the, the book that I just recently read is... Is, is a lot more business building stuff. The Ready, Fire, Aim book. Mm -hmm. I would say that's really good for business building. Not, I wouldn't suggest that per se. Like for real estate investing right now, I would say make sure you read the E Myth, Michael Gerber. Um, Who's the author of Unstoppable Confidence? Jeff Hall's asking. Kent Sayer, S A Y R E. And I, I don't think the book's in print anymore, but. If you scour around a little bit, you can probably find a copy somewhere on eBay or Amazon or something. All right, is it my turn? Sure. I'm, I'm going to think of some other stuff, too. Okay. Um, so I, I get ready to write, guys. Okay. These are truly, like, top-shelf recommendations for me. This is not me just pulling crap off the bookshelf. These are things that have been extremely potent in my life. Um, the one thing, I'm backing him up on that, that is uh, really, I think everybody should read this book. Um, it has, it's basically about channeling you down. What's the one thing I can do today such that by doing it, everything else becomes easier or unnecessary? And then until that one thing is done, everything else is a distraction. And it applies not just to like today, but it applies on a macro scale and a micro scale. Huge, huge concept. Highly recommended. Another book I'm in the process of reading for the second time right now is Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. Um, all of these are on Amazon, by the way. Uh, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. Um, this has blown my mind. It, it's all about uh, differentiating in your world the difference between the trivial many and the vital few. And so much of what we think is important is so unimportant, not just in business, but in life. Um, and learning to understand the difference and then choose to apply yourself to the things that are truly your highest point of leverage and your highest and greatest use uh, is, is an art. But it's critical to living the life that you want to live. So highly recommend that. Talked about this last night, 80-20 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall. Uh, this takes the Pareto Principle to a whole new level. Uh, you're probably familiar with the 80-20 rule, but don't dismiss the book just because you're familiar with the 80-20 rule. This really, um, really amplifies it in some powerful ways that have been very shaping for all of my businesses. A uh, book that is on my list, I haven't read it yet. Uh, so this is the one caveat with this one. It was highly recommended to me by two different mentors, though. It's called Traction. Get a grip on your business. Uh, I, I won't go into describing it uh, as it's been described to me, but I bought it based on some really solid recommendations. So recommend you put that on your reading list just based on the caliber of person who has recommended it to me. Brian Tracy, No Excuses, The Power of Self-Discipline. If you struggle with discipline, self-discipline, uh, I think this is going to be a really powerful, shaping book for you to take in. Patrick, have you ever read that one before? I've, I've read a good bit of Brian Tracy. I haven't ever, I've never even seen that book. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, I was, Dan Kennedy's No BS Time Management, 
Oh, I was coming up with that one next. <laughs> oh, there it is right there. Oh, man. Phenom. It's the best time management book in existence. Now, um, Dan Kennedy doesn't use email. He does. He uses very old school, but um, it doesn't matter. This book will like really shape. It's it's the best time management book in existence. No, like like, like I mean, dealing with time vampires. That is not a real estate tactic. Right. Okay? That is what you're going to learn in Dan Kennedy's book, and it is done. Oh, it has made such an impact on how I just every everything the way I do business. Uh, Keith Jones is asking for the eighty twenty author again. Uh, Perry Marshall, Perry Marshall, Miracle Morning. Um, this has been huge for me. Donald Trump, huge for me. Uh, this year, it has really just completely flipped, turned my mind on. Um, setting aside sacred time to pour into myself to do things that um, basically, if I just if I if I do this, then I win the day, no matter what else happens. Once I actually get to work, so uh, even if you're not a morning person, do not dismiss this. If you're not a morning person, because I am notoriously not a morning person, but this is one of the most powerful books that I've ever read from Yo Pal Hal Hal Elrod, uh, and then. I just found these, but we've already talked about them, but here are what they look like. Thank you, you for Rachel. And uh, Miracle Morning, uh, David's asking the author. It's Elrod, E-L-R-O-D is the name of the Hal author. Elrod. And uh, the last one I'm going to recommend for tonight, I could keep going, is Life and Air. Life and Air is written actually by two very close friends of mine, Steve Cook and Sean McCloskey. This is all about vision. This is about getting a vision for your life that is congruent with who you really want to be. Most people don't have any clue how to build a vision. They understand how to set goals. They understand you know, some of what they're after, but they really don't understand their vision. Uh, this is a, a must read in my opinion. It is in the form of a novel, which is kind of interesting. It's not like a, you know, reading about tactics, um, but uh, yeah, I see Maria says, woo woo, life and air. Uh, yeah, Jason and Sean, those are they're good friends of mine. Jason Roberts and Sean McCloskey. So, highly recommend Life and Air. And I'm done for now. Those are the books I'm gonna. Well, and, I'm gonna stop. and Life Life and Air. One of the things I like about it, it's it's not like it's not a real estate book, but you will. But but it, but it can be related to real estate, and there they have a debt free philosophy, and. Um, there's a lot of advantages and benefits to being a debt-free investor. I mean, think about it. Uh, market goes up and down, doesn't really matter. You're never in a position where you have to sell the property. But it's, it's, it's a unique perspective that a lot of times with some real estate books, it's like leverage, leverage, leverage. You get one house and now here's a creative way where you can leverage the equity and buy four more houses so that you own these all these houses with this little tiny thread of equity inside of them. Check out Life and Air. It's it's a it's a narrative type book, but it will like it's it's the kind of thing that I wish I would have read whenever I started because it would have given me a good alternate view and a and a, and a good other side of a way to build a business than the way that. That uh, I learned, and so many people preach. And it's very countercultural. It's not. It's kind of like, in some ways, it's kind of like the anti-rich dad, poor dad, but not not in a bad way. Um, so, you know, you prepare to have some. Uh, um, uh, for example, good debt versus bad debt. Uh, in the life and air world, there's no such thing as good debt, and it makes a pretty darn strong case as to why. So I won't go into it, but. Um, uh, Ricky's asking me how to spell it. That's why I was putting it up there. It's like it's like millionaire, but with the word life, right? So that's how you do it. And the author is Steve Cook, C O O K. Okay, so that said, I think well, it's I was going to mention. Well, we've had a. I've been answering some of the questions that have come in here. Just people asking, what was the name of the author? What was the name of that book by so and so? Um, yeah. Are we ready for uh, ready for some Q and A? 
Let's do it. All right, guys. So we have uh, this. This concludes the structured, pre-planned portion of our three-part series. Um, sincerely hope that we have uh, rattled your cage in a good way and given you some real serious things to think about. Maybe some that you haven't thought of before. Uh, We've done a Q&A session at the end of both of the previous two nights, and we want to do the same tonight. So uh, the rules of engagement are ask your questions. Uh, type them in the little box there. We will uh, answer questions for, for a little while here, and your questions might relate to what we talked about tonight. They might be completely unrelated. They could, be, they could fit any of the three axioms, okay? doesn't matter. Just... Uh, Toss in your questions, whatever your biggest, most burning question is, and we'll fire away back with you. All right, I'm firing this one at you. Here's a good one. Sammy Crawford, uh, I am a beginning investor. I've been contacted by a very motivated seller looking to sell her home. She is currently living in it. She wants 65000 and the tax value is 94000 and it needs about 10000 in updates. How should I structure the deal? I'm thinking wholesale or lease option. <clears throat> well, um, it does not sound like it has enough margin for a wholesale deal quite, in my opinion. Let me do, let me pull up my little well, chart. If, if tax value is 94, that doesn't necessarily mean that actual value is near that. It could be a bit more. That's true. That's true. But like right. one thing, one thing that could be of benefit is to learn how actual values in your area or in the area of this kind of property relate to how tax values relate to actual value. In some areas, um, like it's pretty close. In other areas, it's pretty far off. But um, go ahead. Now we, what you really need to know, I think, before anything is, and you probably you may already know this, but I don't know if you do embedded in your question. Um, who is, what is the likely exit strategy of the person you would wholesale this to? Now, I'm assuming you're going to wholesale, and if that's not the case. They're thinking of wholesale or lease option, but okay. basically it's just a situation where the seller's, you know, looking to sell, wants 65, you know, yeah. needs a little bit of work. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go assuming first wholesaling because it really is two, two very different things. So if you're going to wholesale this thing, you need to say, okay, if I wholesale this to an investor, what are they going to do with it? And if they're going to, if it's an area that they can retail it, then you need to know what they're going to be able to retail it for. If, on the other hand, they're going to rent it out, you're going to look at it through a whole different lens, right? Because the, the ARV really doesn't matter to a landlord. It's the cash flow or the cap rate or the ROI. Um, different landlords have different priorities. So um, this is where it comes back to you really have to, in my opinion, know, you have to have your finger on the pulse of the people who are buying in that area. Ideally, your own cash buyers list. Which, by the way, let me remind you guys, we have a knowledge bomb on awesomerei.com that gives you 33 different ways you can build your cash buyers list. It's the last thing you will ever need to read about how to build a cash buyers list. But if you don't have a cash buyers list, you can still look in the MLS and see what's going on in this market. Are people paying cash? Are investors paying cash? What are they paying? What are, the, what are those investors then doing with that property? So if it's in a rental area, you're going to filter it a little differently than if it's in a retail area. If it's in a retail area, for arguments, I would look at it as, now let's, let's also assume that the tax value is, uh, is somewhat close to the correct value of the property, which may or may not be true. Because the tax assessor doesn't do an actual appraisal like an appraiser does. It's a drive-by, and it's often wrong. But for argument's sake, if the property's worth $94,000, you multiply that by 70%, you take out $10,000 in repairs, and you are at 55.8. That's a, that's a common formula a rehabber's going to use. So if you want to make $5,000 as a wholesaler assigning that bad boy, 
and you got to be in at about fifty grand. Nope. So, what? go ahead. Well, and, and that, that's just that, that that's a good way to look at it because I mean a lot of investors out there. If they're not just your landlord who's looking to pick up a house or here as a rental long term, um, a lot of them are looking to pick up houses for 70 cents in the dollar or below once repairs are factored in. And so if you can concentrate on getting the property under contract for that number minus whatever you want to make, then there's a good chance you can make money on the property. And like, like being a newer investor, that's okay. Um, like I would, I would do what you can to to figure out if ninety four thousand is near actual value. Find comparable houses, same square footage, similar square footage, bedrooms and baths that are in that same area and neighborhood. See what they're selling for, and just come up with a conservative value. And you can always get the property under contract and give yourself a little bit of time, give yourself an out to pass it by a potential buyer and still walk away without having anything to lose. Um, you know, you're belly to belly with this seller. Like me and my company, it's standard operating procedure to have $10, $10 in earnest money that our even attorney, our attorney, holds. Um, so it's not like you have to risk a lot of money to get the property under contract and uh, would give you an opportunity to control it and then uh, pass it by a buyer. Patrick, uh, Michael asks, is it best to start wholesaling or rehabbing? Um, I, uh, let, me, let me toss out a quick idea and then I'd like to hear your take on that. Uh, I say the answer is it depends. Um, I will say that wholesaling tends to have a, a lower barrier of entry which is why a lot of newer investors start wholesaling because um, you there's a velocity to it. Uh, you don't really have to have capital or access to capital to do it. Um, it can let you get some momentum quickly. But um, some people don't like wholesaling. I was just talking to a gal today, a friend of mine, who she just she'll wholesale a house every once in a while, but she's a rehabber. You know she. She really likes to go in and take a diamond in the rough and make it into a polished diamond. Um, she's an artist in that sense, and, and rehabbing is her craft. Uh, and this goes back to my philosophy that you need to find and focus. Remember the, the milestone, the niche hitch? You need to find and focus on a niche that is congruent with who you are and who you want to be and what you're good at and what your market's asking of you. Your local market is asking of you. So there's no like pat answer that I can give you. It could be that you are wired to be a rehabber and your market is good for it and that's the direction you should go. Um, but you know that's where that's what I mean when I say it depends. Patrick, what's your take on that? Oh, man, I've been answering some questions in the panel. <laughs> okay, right. I'll stop Captain, asking you to weigh in after I've given an answer because you know. right. happened last night too, man. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> That's all right. Well, give me a toss. Me another question then. Which... I think you nailed it. Michael asked Moltke. Ask. Uh, they say not to overthink things, but how do you start with limited knowledge or confidence? Where should you start? And uh, I'll. You want me to toss out a couple things first? Yeah, man. Go. Um, I think you've already started. Like you're here. You're soaking up knowledge. You know, and, and continue taking action, not just with education, but, you know, go meet some local investors in your community. Go to the local real, real estate investors association or other meetup groups um, with entrepreneurs. Surround yourself with some like-minded people. Um, find, some in, find some folks who are, who are where you're at, um, who want to get into real estate investing, but you know, or, or right on that threshold, or find some folks uh, when you're networking that are just above that threshold, and get to know them, and start to build some relationships. I mean, even just being around some investors that are actually out there taking action and doing deals, that's going to be inspiring to you. And um, 
ready or not, you know, just jump in and uh, you're already taking action. Like, where's, where's, you know, limited knowledge and confidence, where's it going to come from? It's only going to come from doing and talking about real estate and studying more and taking some action. That's just part of it. I got a question from Darius. He says, generally, how close are property values of homes on the same street? Darius, again, it depends. <laughs> uh, I'll give you uh, an example of here in Memphis, okay? Back to my story. If you were here at the very beginning of tonight's broadcast, uh, I told about a deal that we have in our wholesaling company right now in Midtown Memphis. And Midtown Memphis is one of those areas where uh, you can have a, a, a three hundred thousand dollar house and a sixty thousand dollar house literally on the same street. Yeah. And oh. it is that can make it a challenge. Um, it just means that you can't look at the numbers from on high and make a lot of assumptions. You have to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. There are areas like that. Now, I would not say that's the norm, though. In my experience, most areas, um, the uh, you know, properties on the same street, you can uh, you can kind of go with a similar dollars per square foot. Now yeah, there are a few more square footage bedrooms and baths, then they're probably worth around the same same amount. Yeah, there's a few things to bear in mind with that though. Um, if you have a house that um, has an extra bedroom and extra square footage, obviously that one's going to be worth more. Uh, but also larger houses that are comps, if it has more square footage, it tends to sell for less per square foot. That's kind of a, an interesting thing that a lot of people don't know. So, you know, let's say you got a house that's like $100,000 and it's selling for $100 a foot, okay? And then you got a, a house on the same street that uh, sold for, or maybe it's got um, 250 square feet more or 500 square feet more. It's not going to sell for 100 a foot. It might sell for 95 a foot. Um, that's just the way appraisers look at it. So bear that in mind as you're kind of comparing things. And, and you've always got kind of the biggest house in the neighborhood syndrome where if you're dealing with a house that's a lot more square footage or on the highest end of the square footage of the neighborhood, you're not, just like he was saying, you're not going to get the dollar per square foot that you do in some of the smaller houses. All right, let's see. What else we got? Um, uh, David says, are you assuming the tax assessed value is typical of the area? No, I'm not making, I'm, I was assuming that for argument's sake, just to, just to be able to give an explanation, but that is definitely not the case. I would not make that assumption. Um, and, and let me talk about comps for a second. When you're comping a house, um, we, if you've heard us talk about uh, how we do our initial offers in our wholesaling company, it, you might this won't surprise you, but you guys might be a little surprised to learn that we actually use the Zestimate as our initial starting point for an offer. I know, right? The Zestimate is not... Doesn't sound good, man. Sometimes it's close, sometimes it's not. But our purpose in when we make our initial offer to a seller is not to get them to say yes. It's to drop a lure in the water and see if they're willing to nibble. So the, a quick, easy way that we can do that is to work a formula based on the Zestimate right there while we're on the phone with them, and then we see if we have somebody who wants to play ball with us. Now, once we have a shy yes out of them or we can tell, okay, they've got the motivation, like we're in a ballpark that, that seems like it probably makes sense, then we go to hard comps, okay? And hard comps, it doesn't take you that long to do it. It takes a little practice at first to learn how to do it. But basically, it's it, you're either going MLS or you're going some. In some areas, there's like regional services. Like uh, these may not mean anything to you guys, but like courthouse retrieval system and Chandler reports. There's some non-MLS systems that can give you good comps. Um, you can also do comps, uh, investor comps online. Our friend Mark Jackson has a comp service, and those are good comps. I, I'm a I'm a I'm a believer in investor comps online. Um, you can get real comps from Zillow, but it's hard to get the data in a way that is easy to analyze from Zillow. 
and you can't control the variables in the data well enough in Zillow to really use it consistently for comps, in my opinion. So anyway, just a word on comps. I feel like that, that's a common question I hear, and I thought it might be helpful to a lot of you guys. Did you find another question to pop out there, or were we both looking? Um, do, do the homes that you buy, I guess, uh, have to be in great condition? If not, what amount of repairs is acceptable? Um, that's, that is definitely a personal question just based on the types of properties that you want to work on um, and your business model. Like me personally, I do not like huge renovations, hate gut jobs and like a uh, friend, Daniil Clayman, seeing some of the pictures of some of the houses that he's gutting on Facebook and building from scratch, like I want nothing to do with. Yeah. Um, I've done, like kind of my bread and butter with rehabs over the years has been your fifteen to twenty, twenty-five thousand dollar rehab um, on your cookie cutter house in Charleston that's in like the first time home buyer price range out of the ghettos and war zones that's under price points that don't cash flow as well. Um, you know, I love picking up a good house in a good neighborhood, in decent condition, in great condition that a motivated seller is ready to dump. Um, oftentimes, properties need fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, you know, just on the regular. Um, like, what amount of repairs is acceptable? It's all up to you and your business model and what you want to deal with. Some people hate renovations. Some people love them, and some people like the bigger the better. Um, so that's going to be just for you to figure out what kind of deals you want to focus on and and uh, go from there. Let me clarify too, if you're a rehabber, I think if you're a new rehabber, I would recommend you start with something lighter just to get your feet wet because something that's intense, if you don't know what you're doing, can bury you quickly. That said, that's where some of the biggest profit margins are. The yuckier the house, the bigger the profit margin. If you're a wholesaler, it's a moot point because you're not you're not shopping for yourself. You're shopping for your cash buyers and what they want. So I don't care. I want whatever my buyers want. That's the business that I'm in is knowing what a deal is to them. And some of them love a house that where the floors are falling in and there's like a thousand dead cats laying around. And then others don't. So, you know, for what that's worth. John Walton has a question here. I have a property that did not work on now, have property that did work on now renting. Okay, so you did a work on this, on this house, some work on this house, now you're renting it out. What's the best way to get a chunk of money out? The banks are not letting me borrow against due to it being an investment property. Okay, I have two solutions for you, John. Um, two possible solutions. One, don't go to the banks, find a private lender, okay? Private lender, especially someone who's familiar with investment property, they're going to be more understanding. Second, um, record a mortgage against the property for the amount that, I mean, I'm not, how do I put this? Uh, let me give you an example. I think this may, be, may give you a little light bulb. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who they bought a house and they wanted to they bought a house for like 200 grand and they wanted to put about $20,000 worth of work into it and then it would be worth two, around 250 once they put the 20 in now this is not an investor this was an individual okay they were living in the house bought the house for, for 200 grand want to put 20 into it it'll be worth it'll appraise for about 250 after that and they were like how do I you know after I spend that 20 grand, I kind of, that hurts, that's cash, like, can I refinance and just get that money back? And I said, well, maybe, maybe not. The bank may not want you to do that because it's a cash out refinance. So what you do is you borrow the 20 grand from your in-laws to do the rehab. 
and you give your in-laws a mortgage, a second mortgage on the property. You record a second mortgage for the $20,000 uh, on your in-laws' behalf, which is totally legitimate, right? Now, there's a mortgage, so you go to refinance, and the bank that you're going to refinance with says, there's a mortgage here. Yes, we're going we're gonna to let you borrow the $220,000 and pay off the first and the second because there's a second mortgage. If you just said, hey, I just want to pull the $20,000 out because I spent it on re that's a cash out refinance. We're not comfortable with that. But if they see a mortgage on the property for that, then they will do that because that's standard operating procedure. So in this situation, come up with a legitimate way to put a mortgage on the property for the amount of money that you're, that, that you're talking about. I'm not saying do anything deceptive or illegal. Make it legitimate. Come up with a legitimate way to do it and then have that mortgage paid off when you refinance. It's a lot simpler. Here's right. a quick qu here, quick question from Mark Mark D. Um, is tax value different from appraised value? So, like the county uh, has a certain value uh, recorded for what they're going to base the taxes on on the property. And sometimes they call that, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as tax value, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as tax appraised value. Um, so that, that may be the same thing, but actual value, like if you went to an appraiser and got them to do an actual appraisal on the property, then that could be totally different from what the county values the property. Yeah, and basically, just ignore the county's value, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it doesn't mean a whole, it doesn't mean much. It doesn't. Use comps instead. Don't don't go on the. I mean, you can use the county's appraisal if you want to do it. Use it like I do, as the, like we use this estimate. But I mean, why not just use this estimate? I trust this estimate more than I trust the county's appraisal most of the time, and I don't really trust this estimate. So <laughs> take that for what it's worth. Got a question from Maria. Maria says. Do you usually send only the discounted cash offer or a letter of intent with A or B offers, like a cash and a terms? Any thoughts? Um, I do not give good phone yet. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that. It sounds a little dirty, though. <laughs> not good on the phone yet. <laughs> um, okay, so... That's a good question. Uh, I've done it both ways. Currently, our, our process does not involve a lot of multiple choice offers, but I'm not opposed to it as a strategy necessarily. Uh, one of the smartest guys I know, Walter Wofford, and just down the road here in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, he always makes three offers to every seller he talks to. He makes an all-cash offer that's low, he makes an all-terms offer that has a high price but very favorable terms. And then he makes a hybrid offer that's part cash and part terms that's kind of in the middle. And uh, he usually tries to steer them towards whichever one he, he thinks is going to solve their problem the best. But he always makes those three offers. And it's a, it's a fine strategy. Um, but currently, now I'm not the one in our business dealing directly with sellers anymore. And James... Uh, I find it simplifies things to have him only make the cash offer with the, the amount of lead volume that we have coming in and the amount of time that I want him spending with, uh, with any individual lead. Uh, it just kind of makes best sense to us right now that he just makes a cash offer. Now, if it's a situation where the circumstances of the seller seem especially uh, uh, conducive to a terms offer, then we'll go that direction as well, maybe make multiple offers. But unless we have a sense that that may be especially good for this situation based on the story the sellers told us, then we're just making cash offers right now. It's just kind of our choice. Hey, Tim Mitchell asked uh, if, we, if you happen to know what the website link is for Mark's Investor Comps Online. I think it's InvestorCompsOnline.com. I'll check it out. Yeah, might be InvestorCompsOnline.com. Mark's a great dude. He's a 
He was. He came to a few mastermind meetings that we hosted. There it is. Back in the day, and he is quite a golfer as well. Man is passionate about golf. More passionate about golf than any person I've ever met. There was a couple other questions I was coming through that were just asking about how to get good comps. I mean, my my preference personally with comps is MLS. I'm not a realtor, but I've got a couple friends who are, and even early on, as soon as I befriended a realtor, I just asked politely for their logins, and uh, that's what I have done. Um, JP, you want to throw out that ninja tip for getting MLS access? Like, what do you do? You yeah, MLS? and I, that that's actually uh, ties in well with a question from Denise. Do I have? Do I already have to have a real estate license or brokerage license? Um, I'm going to answer both of those simultaneously. Um, I you do not have to have a real estate license to be an investor, okay? Because you're you have property owner rights or you, individual rights. You can buy and sell houses uh, legally. Um, is it advisable? It's kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. There's schools of thought and and pros and cons to both sides of it. And I've been both. I started my career not licensed. I became licensed for a few years, and then I retired my license. I've thought about getting in again. Um, I don't know, really. I mean, I, it's a whole discussion I don't really want to have right now. Um, it should not hold you back from moving forward, though. Um, obviously, one of the benefits of being licensed is you have unlimited access to the MLS through your own login, which is certainly an asset to be able to uh, look up uh, at good MLS comps and just to you know to be able to mine through the MLS. Um, a couple of the strategies in our 33 Ways to Find Cash Buyers Knowledge Bomb on AwesomeREI.com specifically are for those who do have MLS access. If you don't have MLS access and you want it and you're not licensed, here's how you do it. You um, become an unlicensed assistant, an agent's assistant. It's as simple as that. Now, I am currently a local, I have a, a local friend of mine who's an investor. Uh, we've done some deals together. I wholesale him a couple houses. His name's Mike, and he also is licensed. I said, Mike, do you have an assistant? He was like, no, I don't really, I mean, I, have, I do, but not like, you know, a realtor assistant. I said, that's cool. So I need MLS access. Could I be your assistant? Hmm says Mike. Okay. Now, he didn't even ask this of me, but what I do for Mike is pay his MLS dues. Now, Mike doesn't call me and say, hey, assistant, I need you to do some assistantly duties. If he did, I'd find somebody else. But yes, for you fellow 13-year-olds, I just said duties. And that's like a legit thing across all MLSs that you can pretty much, like a realtor can have an assistant that's yes. not licensed that can legitimately get their own logins for MLS. Yes, and now yes, it is a, it's a workaround in the system for sure. Um, technically, I am Mike's assistant, but you know we have an understanding he's not really treating me like an assistant in this situation, and I pay his MLS dues, and he doesn't have to worry about paying him anymore. It's like 800 bucks total a year or something like that. Well worth it to me to have my own login to the MLS, um, and and the MLSs, as you said, Patrick, do have an allowance for an unlicensed assistant for realtors to have an unlicensed assistant with their own MLS access. So um, that's just a little little trick of the trade. And uh, I know there's probably some licensed people who are hearing that and going, oh, "Sacre bleu!" But I just calm your jets, okay? Just it's okay. World's not going to end. We're all on the same team, okay? I'm not anti-realtor. Some of my best friends are realtors, and while I do know that there's some uh, idiot realtors out there, there's some idiot investors out there, and there's some really awesome people who are realtors. So I, we're playing for the same team. High five, realtors! High five. I'm not a realtor, so I'm not going to high five you. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, Elvis. 
um, asks, uh, he says, I'm new here for the first time. My question is, where can I find cash buyers? We've got a resource for you. JP, pull it up real quick. Just show them the site and the knowledge bomb. All right, go to awesomerei.com. When you get there, click up here top, at the top, click on Awesome Blog, and scroll down till you see 33 ways to build a ridiculous cash buyers list. Clickety-click. Clickety-click. And you'll see, when you get past the image of the Sound of Music head explosion, you'll see these three tabs. The first tab is, hi, I'm awkward. Those are networking tactics. The second is thug life. Those are street tactics. And the third is the internets. Those are the web and tech tactics. And there you go. You're welcome. End of story. Nice. Knowledge yeah, so bomb. knowledge bomb. Um, yeah, we've got a couple bombs for you waiting for you over on Awesome REI. One of them has to do with building your cash buyers list. So head on over. All right, let's see what else we got here. <sighs> hmm. Uh, yeah, Maria is finding it hard to believe that we use the Zestimate for our initial starting point on our offers. <laughs> I found that hard to believe, too. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, you've got Red a formula Red where, you, where you're comfortable knowing that based on the Zestimate or typical Zestimates in your area that your formula is going to be a low enough offer to considerably make room for any miscalculations, I guess. 15 minute warning. We're going to go fit no more than 15 minutes on uh, Q&A here. That'll take us up to 10 p.m., okay? Cool. All right. Um, Dennis says, how about Redfin for comps? Um, I have heard good things about Redfin. I've never used them, so I can't tell you from first-hand experience, uh, but I would I definitely check it out. I, I, was, I think it's redfin.com, R-E-D-F-I-N. Um, so give a shot and, and give us some feedback, actually, Dennis. Um, let's see. Here, here's an interesting one from James Bradshaw, who just said, do you hate selling gut jobs compared to lipstick properties for wholesale, or do you care? I don't hate, I hate, I'll sell anything that makes me money. Yeah, I mean, I personally would hate buying a gut job and having to deal with the gut job, but wholesaling it doesn't really matter. You know, some people like them. Some, you know, some people like the gut job. Some people like just having to put some lipstick on them. So if it doesn't fit your business model, sell it, wholesale it. Bill Major is backing up Redfin.com as a good source of comps in certain markets. Um, and David asks if we've used Finest Expert for comping. Never heard of it, actually, David. Um, maybe you could drop a, a URL. I'd, I'd be interested to check it out. All right, let's see. Start prehabbing before rehabbing. William Turner drops some uh, advice. He recommends that you start prehabbing before rehabbing. Let me talk about that just briefly. Uh, prehabbing is um, it's when you buy a house uh, that needs that needs work, but you don't go in and like do the full rehab job. You do what I kind of call a, a clean and clear, um, where you might go in and like you, you declutter, you get you de-junk it. Uh, if there's holes in the walls, then maybe you go ahead and knock bigger holes so people can see inside the walls. If uh, you go in the kitchen and you know there's no way they're going to keep this kitchen because it's trash, then you go ahead and demo the kitchen. You get it out of there. Um, the landscaping, right? Maybe you just go and you uh, rip out what's there and then you drop some fresh sod. So basically you're, you're creating a, a clean slate. Um, Though that's at least one version of prehabbing. There, there was a there was a house in uh, James Island that right before tax sale, a fine fellow who lived out of state, uh, who owed taxes, responded, and we bought the house, and we actually did, did buy it and close on it just to sprint to closing because it was a home run. And we didn't want to do the rehab. There was a little bit of some settlement issues, and it was just a big job. 
Um, so I guess, I mean, I didn't know at the time, but I guess we kind of prehabbed it because there was so much crap on the inside. We got a dumpster there. We got the whole house cleaned out, cleared out, and that's all we did, literally. So with some wholesales, we also would do a little landscaping, um, but I'm with you on that. Okay, so got a question here uh, from Donna. Wait, is that right? No. Uh, Bob Frost, how do I get proper proof of funds for an REO property to make an offer when lenders won't even talk to me until I've already until I already have the property under contract. Uh, my exit is to rehab and sell retail. Now, first of all, I don't know what lenders won't talk to you until you have it under contract, but most people who lend money for real estate understand that providing a proof of funds letter is par for the course. So that's a little odd to me if they won't even talk to you until you have it under contract. I think maybe you could reapproach them and say, um, I can't put a contract on an REO without proof of funds, what would you recommend? Like, ask them what they recommend in that situation, um, or find a different lender. Now, I brought up on the on my uh, screen here, cashformyclosing.com. This is a uh, transactional funding uh, uh, setup run by a friend of mine named uh, Brian Mitum, and he offers, you can actually buy uh, for a couple bucks, maybe five, ten bucks, a uh, uh, proof of funds letter that you can use. Um, some REOs don't like a proof of funds letter. They want to see a bank statement. So in that, if you're in that situation, this won't work. This is more of a letter. And it's legit. I mean, he's a legitimate transactional funder. He also does hard money, but I think he only does hard money to his students and friends. Um, but I'm sending you to him as a resource for proof of funds letters. Uh, he's not a scam. He's a solid dude in, uh, in the north who does a lot of deals. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps, Bob. I think um, either you're possibly mistaken about them not being willing to give you a proof of funds or they need to understand how the business works. All right. Um, Here's a, I think this actually carries over from last night because we had a couple questions and I think we briefly covered one, but um, Maria asks, would you please, ex please, all caps, expand on the, on your caution towards not saying, like, I guess specifically with wholesaling, we sell, like, that we sell houses, etc. if you're only flipping contracts, like, what wording sounds right to the public? Sure, sure, be glad to. Um, so recently, uh, very uh, pretty well-known real estate attorney by the name of Jeff Watson put out some videos um, where he sat down and had a conversation with the Ohio some members of the Ohio Real Estate Commission. I think they call it something else besides the Real Estate Commission, but it's basically the equivalent of that. And he asked them a series of questions about wholesaling and like how they view wholesaler activities. Now understand in Ohio. Uh, the Real Estate Commission there has been uh, really clamping down on what they perceive to be wholesalers practicing real estate without a license. So um, this uh, conversation that Jeff had was kind of in, in, sorry, in conjunction with a lot of that. And one of the things that came out of that in that conversation was that um, their belief is that uh, it's not legitimate to advertise a property for sale if you don't own that property. Now, I have had the understanding since 2000 when I got into this that when you put a property under contract, you have then acquired something called equitable interest. You don't own the property, but you do have an equitable interest in the property. It's one of the bundle of ownership rights. If, you, um, if you've ever been through real estate school or maybe you've heard this analogy, um, you think of owning real estate as like a bundle of sticks. And each little stick in that bundle is one small right, uh, one aspect of the total ownership. And when I put a contract on a property, or when I, let's say I give Patrick a contract to buy the property, I give him one stick from that bundle and he then holds it, and it's called equitable interest. 
Uh, it's kind of like an easement on your property, right? You may own the property outright, but if you have an easement, a, like a local municipality easement, they're still going to get access to your property to put in that utility pole because they have an easement. It doesn't matter that you own the property free and clear. They have that stick from your bundle of rights. So I'm kinda, I hope this makes sense, but um, I've been, always been told, this is just like common real estate investor wholesaling 101, when I put a contract on a property, I have equitable interest. When I have equitable interest, I can market that property for sale as long as I don't actually sell it before I own it, right? I mean, that would be wrong. You can't sell something you don't own, but I can market it for sale knowing I'm going to be buying it. That's kind of how wholesaling has worked for a long time. Well, even though that's congruent with contract law, the Real Estate Commission in Ohio said, we still think it's not legitimate. We don't buy it. And ultimately, they're going to win that battle because if they believe that they don't, that it's not right for you to do it, they're not going to go to court and lose on contract law. They're going to win. The judge is going to see that you, the slimy real estate investor, has taken advantage of people and blah, 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 and you're not going to win that battle. I'm going to tell you, if you've never been to court, something you need to understand is that there's the law, and then sometimes there's what happens in court, and they're not always the same thing. I've been in tenant landlord court, and I've had a judge say this. I kid you not, the judge has said, son, I know what the law is. Let me tell you how we're going to do it in my courtroom today. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. Yeah, I mean, there are judges that are pro-tenant. And there's judges that are pro pro landlord, you know, it's, and and they're going to bend the law and do whatever they feel like doing, basically. So hearing this from Jeff with the Ohio Real Estate Commission, I had a separate conversation with Jeff, and I and we looked at at Tennessee and kind of looked at the nation, and I basically was just like, look, I just want like I want to know it is there a trend here that extends outside of Ohio. And if so, kind of what are the best practices? And I, I, I'm not going to go into any more depth than that, but I'll tell you that one of the changes that we have made and that we now recommend to people is that you no longer advertise a house for sale if you're a wholesaler. You advertise a contract for sale, and it needs to be clear, not a little blurb at the bottom. It needs to be contract on blank, and that's at least one good step you can take to... Um, to draw a line of distinction to set yourself apart and keep yourself out of the crosshairs. Also, as I said last night, um, we do not advertise our wholesale deals um, publicly anymore. We don't put them, you know, you hear a lot of people say, uh, put it on postlets, Zillow owns postlets, you know, it's on Zillow, you know, get it out everywhere you can, and yes, you can get some. You can get more money for your wholesale deal sometimes when you do that because it's syndicated everywhere and you get more eyeballs on it. It's marketing 101. But the downside to that is, then you get a call from a realtor and says, "Hey, we saw your house. Our buyer saw your house on on Zillow, and we like to schedule closing, please." And you say, "Okay, yeah, sure. Well, I don't own it. Let me check with the owner." And like, "Oh, you're a realtor? No, I'm not a realtor. I I just have a contract on it." Huh? Let me call you back. Click. Boop, 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 boop. State Real Estate Commission. You got to get these guys. I know I'm being a little silly here, but I, <laughs> I'm a silly guy. That's happened. I know two people that's happened to, and they've had a call from the State Real Estate Commission saying, I'm going to bury you. I got in your face because that's how scared they were when they got that call. So yeah, that wouldn't be a good. That wouldn't be a fun call to get for sure. It wouldn't, and I'm sorry. That was a, a long explanation. My wife gets on to me for how wordy I can be sometimes. But that hopefully that really crystallizes for you guys why we've made those changes in our wholesaling business. Um, Maria says, "Don't laugh at me, guys." I'm sorry, Maria. If I la I didn't know what I laughed at. I don't remember. But if it seemed like I was laughing at you, I wasn't. I just laughed. I laugh a lot. Didn't mean harm. Didn't mean ill will. No harm, Maria, uh, Maria. And we're super glad to have you here with us. All right, we got uh, time for one more. You pick it, buddy. I am. I 
I have not. Okay. Let's see, a lot of these are just kind of statements. Uh, I can, I got one if you don't if you don't have one handy. I yeah, see what one. You what you got? Um, if you're flipping a house and you go to sell it, in your opinion, is it best to use an agent or sell it yourself? Um, it's a good question. <clears throat> good question. We don't use agents to wholesale our properties because we're good at marketing um, and we market to our buyers list and we just go directly to them. Um, it wouldn't be a bad idea to sell it with an agent in the right circumstances. Uh, for example. If we, uh, this house I was talking about at the very beginning of, of our call tonight in Midtown, if we, we close on this, we do a quick clean and clear, a little prehab, uh, to just put it back up on the MLS, we'll go through an agent to do that. I'm, I'm not going to use my, you know, I can't list a property, I'm just an assistant. So I'll go through an agent to do that. Um, basically, if I feel like it's going to be to my benefit, to go through an agent, I'll go through an agent. But I don't have to go through an agent for most of the deals that we do. And it would just be needless money that I would be spending on commissions. Like on, on the retail side, if, if I'm looking to sell it to a retail buyer, somebody who's buying at or around the value of the property and it's not a wholesale deal, I like hiring agents because I don't like to do all the things that agents do. Um, I mean, and, and, and of course there can be like, like at times <clears throat> we'll uh, for sale by owner a property for a couple weeks maybe first and then transition to listing it with a realtor if we're looking for that retail buyer. Um, but I like agents for trying to sell at or around the value um, for sure. Okay, well, that's a wrap. It's been three amazing evenings, guys, and we have really enjoyed, I've thoroughly enjoyed being here with you and pouring out and just, just uh, having a chance to hopefully sharpen some axes. Um, thank you guys for being a part of this with us. Um, let me just, I guess, end with this. AwesomeREI.com, it is... Um, it is about you. It is about a culture of doing this thing better, doing it awesomer, and having a lot of fun in the process. Uh, it is something that we are going to be putting really base. Almost all of this version, this side of our world, is going to be going into that now. Um, you know, we still have our our real estate endeavors and whatnot. But, you know, we run our business like a business, so it's not doesn't pull on us as much as it used to. So it gives us the opportunity to be able to walk alongside and help and coach and cultivate uh, some of us, uh, some of you guys who can benefit from that. So dial in with us, stay dialed in with us, and we'll make it worth your while. Patrick, anything, any final thoughts, buddy? Uh, yeah, a couple just thoughts like uh, when you head out of here tonight, head over to Awesome REI. We've got some knowledge bombs already over there for you, so dig in. And we got some questions earlier. I answered, you may have noticed that it looked like I was probably looking over here and I was answering a number of questions during the training. We had a few tonight and last night and the night before that were all asking about um, you know, if you own the private money blueprint or private money on demand or 10 hour wholesaler or whatever, you know, where do you consume those products now? Do you still have access? The answer is yes, you still have access. You still can consume those products where you have been. Um, eventually, we are going to have the members area built out for our different products and programs at Awesome REI. So that is coming down the pipeline. Um, it's, it's basically going to be our home base. It is the new name of the company. And really, like originally, somebody asked last night, we didn't get the question, like, why did you change the name? And the reason why is because originally when the company was started, um, we launched the Private Money Blueprint Home Study Course and named the company Private Money Blueprint. Um, maybe a little short-sighted. <laughs> Um, because the company is much more than that. I mean, we're, we've grown into the, to an education company for investors 
that teaches on all different kinds of topics, that got, has all different kinds of trainers. Um, like, for instance, 10-Hour Wholesaler, where Justin Wilmot is the expert. He is the man. It's his business model. We're just bringing his awesomeness to the world through publishing his product and his, his, uh, his methods. And um, it's just awesome to have you here. Thank you all for being here. This has been so cool. Uh, the last three nights, these live trainings get an answer, a lot of you, you guys' questions, and uh, it's been a pleasure. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank we look you, thank to you. The future. We got a lot of, lot, of, lot of cool stuff coming down the pipeline soon, <coughs> podcast, <coughs> um, amongst many other things. And Hey, do us a favor, too. Um, when you have a chance to go check out the, the two knowledge bombs that we've posted so far, if you would, just leave us a comment. Um, we're paying attention, and we've, we've got a couple of comments, but... Um, hoping to get a little more interaction because I'd like to hear from you. Um, I'd love to know what your thoughts are. I'm not looking for you to, you know, just pat us on the back for whatever. I really want to hear what your thoughts are. And if you have a specific request for a future knowledge bomb, something that you'd like us to focus a knowledge bomb on, drop it in a comment as well, uh, and we'll definitely consider it. Okay? Yeah, and, and before you head out, let us know how we did tonight. Um, hit the question panel. If you've been lurking, and I see you, you've been lurking in the background and you've yet to type in a little something, hit it up. Let us know what you thought, what you'd like to see more of, less of, whatever. We're here for you and, uh, and for just the community of it all. It's, it's, uh, this is really cool, and we've got some big things coming, not for us, but for, all of, for, for you, for all of us collectively. And we're going to do some big things together. 2016 is coming. It's going to be big. All right, guys. That's a wrap. Thank you. High five. Internet high five, everybody. How about a, well, how about a cheers instead of the internet high five? Cheers. Boom. All right. Good night, everybody. Good Have a happy again. Thursday. Soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I always have a hard time figuring out how to stop this thing. I see you. I, I paused my video feed, so I'm gone. Bam. Just disappeared. <laughs> All right. So JP, what's up? What, what's you? What's you off to next? Um, I don't know. I'm gonna go see what the fan. Oh, you know what? I do know what I'm gonna do. We're buying a house. I gotta fill out a, a contract tonight. Is, now, is this personal residence? Yeah, personal residence. We're moving. Um, if we get our off contract accepted, we went and saw it today, and awesome. uh, moving out into, just a little bit into the country. And uh, yeah, so I'm gonna get to that. I'll let you know how it goes. You leaving town tomorrow? I am. I'm off to San Diego. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, San Diego. Okay, I know how to say it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be hanging out with Daniil, our Russian friend, the next couple of days. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm a little jealous. I'm a little Jay, but have fun and take some good notes and let me know how it goes. Hopefully we don't end up at a Russian restaurant. Um, yeah, stay, stay away from the vodka. Or just remember just remember your last experience with, in, uh, in his hands uh, when involved vodka. I remember. I'm I'm no Russian, that's for sure. But um, yeah, I'll be back. Uh, I fly back next Wednesday, and we'll be back at it. Uh, regular back to work next Thursday. So. Good stuff. Day to the P. Have a good one, brother. All right, you too. And to the 99 of you eavesdropping in on us, have an awesome night. Bye-bye. Later, guys. Later.